So good afternoon, everyone. I'm Christophe Pierre. I'm the provost at Stephen Institute of Technology. And today, it is my uh, real pleasure to welcome all of you to the provost lecture on women in leadership and to welcome a distinguished guest speakers, Dr. Mena pratt -Clark. Mena. Uh, so this lecture series, as you may know, showcases the achievements of prominent and successful women in a variety of fields. Our goal in presenting these talks is to in inspire our entire communi university community, but especially our female students, of staff, and faculty to overcome obstacles, uh, seize opportunities, and make the most of their strengths. Uh, so over the years in this lecture series, we've hosted entrepreneurs, uh, policy experts, corporate leaders, technology innovators, uh, even a former White House doctor who have shared their fascinating experiences. And their insights do continue to motivate the next generation of women leaders and everyone at Stevens. Uh, I'm also proud to say that this initiative is really just one of several initiatives this lecture series is one of several initiatives that we've t undertaken to enhance the success of women faculty, staff, and students at Stevens. Uh, for instance, Stevens is home to the Laurel Center for Women's Leadership, which is a living and learning center whose programs aim to increase knowledge and increase also understanding of issues affecting women while building community. Uh, Stevens is also the recipient of an NSF, National Science Foundation, advance grant to increase the participation of advancement of women in academic science and engineering careers. Under this grant, we work on improving the academic climate to enhance faculty success and increase the representation of women in engineering and in the sciences. Uh, also, improving the diversity of our undergraduate and graduate student body, faculty and staff is an institutional priority at Stevens which is actually enshrined in our 10-year strategic plan. And although we still have work to do in this area, we're making progress, especially in fields in which women are often underrepresented. So currently, 29% of our undergraduate students and 29% also of our grad students are women, and so are 25% of our full-time faculty. So this is a solid achievement for an institution that is focused largely on uh, STEM fields. So now to our guest speaker. Our guest speaker today, Dr. Pratt Clark, has been a transformative leader at several major universities. Uh, she's currently the Vice President for Strategic Affairs and Diversity at Virginia Tech. That's a university with more than 34,000 students, 1,500 full-time faculty, $530 million in research funding, and an operating budget of $1.6 billion. I looked all of this up before <laughs> coming here. <laughs> uh, she's also a professor of education with affiliations in Africana Studies, Women and Gender Studies, and the Department of Sociology. So from what I know about her responsibilities at Virginia Tech, which sometimes I still call VPI, uh, she holds really three full-time jobs there. She's a prolific professor and researcher she is VP Strategic Affairs in charge of the University Strategic Plan, and she is VP for Diversity. Uh, so Mena and I first met when we were both at the University of Illinois, which is not a large flagship uh, public university. Uh, at that time, she was already doing multiple demanding jobs. Uh, she was reporting to the Chancellor as Associate Chancellor and to the Provost as Associate Provost for Diversity. Uh, I remember first interacting with her in her capacity really as Chief of Staff to the Chancellor, at that time Phyllis Wise, uh, only to, find, to gradually find out, uh, to my really amazement, that she was also in charge of strategic affairs, of diversity, and also a faculty member. Uh, so she and I worked closely during uh, more than four years together at the U of I, and um, I would say we were na navigating uh, what seemed uh, times of uh, perhaps regular tumult at that university. Uh, but sometimes, despite this uh, sometimes difficult environment, uh, as a responsible and a committed steward of the institution, MENA always stayed the course and made major advances in both strategic planning and diversity for the Urbana Champaign uh, campus. 
and it was really a pleasure to work with, with her. Uh, Dr. Pratt Clark has led a professional life filled with achievements. She has more than 20 years of administrative, academic, and legal experience in higher education with a focus on large scale institutional transformation. Prior to joining Virginia Tech, as I mentioned, she served as Associate Chancellor and Associate Provost at the University of Illinois Urbana Champaign for nine years. Uh, before that, she was at Vanderbilt University in Nashville for eight years, and there she was the University Compliance Officer. Assistant Secretary of the University and University Council. Uh, impressively, as I alluded to, in addition to her full time administrative responsibilities, Mena has been a prolific researcher. Her research interests include transdisciplinary analysis of diversity issues in higher education. Her most recent book, A Black Woman's Journey from Cotton Picking to College Professor Lessons Learned About Race, Class, and Gender in America was awarded the Critics' Choice Award by the American Education Studies Association for scholarship deemed outstanding in its field. Dr. pratt has a, has a bachelor's degree from the University of Iowa with a major in English and minors in philosophy and African-American <coughs> studies. She's also received a master's degree in literary studies from the University of Iowa and a master's degree in sociology from Vanderbilt. That's not it. In addition, she's earned a PhD and a JD from Vanderbilt University. Also, I think very importantly, while in, in Nashville, uh, she's taught that men's and women's mass maximum and minimum security prisons through American Baptist College and at Fisk University. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Mena Pratt-Clark. Good afternoon. It's an absolute honor and privilege for me to be here, and I want to thank the president and the provost and their leadership teams for just hosting me and, and welcoming me. I've had some wonderful conversations today with faculty, staff, and students. I want to start my talk today with a short video. The Negro Mother by Langston Hughes. Children, I come back today to tell you a story of a long, dark way that I had to climb, that I had to know in order that the race might live and grow. Look at my face, dark as the night, yet shining like the sun with love's true light. I am the dark girl who crossed the Red Sea, bringing in my body the seed of the free. I'm the woman who worked in the field, bringing the cotton and corn to yield. I am the one who labored as a slave, beaten and mistreated for the work that I gave. Children sold away from me, husbands sold too. No safety, no love, no respect was I due. 300 years in the deepest south, but God put a song and a prayer in my mouth. God put a dream like steel in my soul. Now through my children, I'm reaching the goal. Now through my children, young and free, I realized the blessings denied to me. I couldn't read them, I couldn't write. I had nothing back there in the night. Sometimes the valley was filled with tears, but I kept trudging on through the lonely years. Sometimes the road was hot with the sun, but I had to keep on till my work was done. I had to keep on, no stopping for me. I was the seed of the coming free. I nourished a dream that nothing could smother, deep in my breast, the Negro mother. I had only hope then, but now through you, dark ones, today my dreams must come true. All you dark children in the world out there, remember my sweat, my pain, my despair. Remember my years heavy with sorrow, and make of those years a torch for tomorrow. Make of my past a rose road to the light out of the darkness, the ignorance, the night. Lift high my banner out of the dust. Mother to Son by Langston Hughes. Well, son, I'll tell you, life for me ain't been no crystal stair. It's had tacks in it and splinters 
and boards torn up, and places with no carpet on the floor, bare. But all the time I've been climbing on and reaching landings and turning corners, and sometimes going in the dark where there ain't been no light. So boy, don't you turn back. Don't you step down on the steps because you find it kind of hard. Don't you fall now. For I still going, honey, I still climbing. And life for me ain't been no crystal stair. So who is this woman? This black woman who recites the Negro mother. This woman who has symbolically come back today to tell us the story of the long dark way that she had to climb, that she had to know in order that the race might live and grow. This woman who implores us to look at her dark skin, to see the woman who worked in the field bringing the cotton and corn to yield. The woman who had nothing, whose valley was filled with tears but kept trudging through the lonely years who had to keep on, there was no stopping for her. This woman who said that God put a song and prayer in her mouth and a dream like steel in her soul, who nourished a dream that nothing could smother, who begs us to look at her pain, her despair, her sweat, to remember her years heavy with sorrow and to make of those years a torch for tomorrow. This woman who asks us to lift high her banner out of the dust, who hopes that her dreams and prayers can impel us up the great stairs of life, stairs that aren't crystal or shiny, without easy landings or next steps. This woman who almost chastises us and tells us, don't turn back, don't sit down because it's hard, don't fall down, keep climbing. This woman who took a year of music and poetry lessons at the age of 80, battling Alzheimer's and recorded a DVD with instructions to play them at a her funeral, almost symbolically defying death by singing and reciting poetry at her own funeral. This woman who embodies the Negro mother that Langston Hughes wrote about. This Negro mother is Dr. Mildred Pratt, my mother. Last year, I published her autobiography, A Black Woman's Journey from Cotton Picking to College Professor, Lessons About Race, Class, and Gender in America. She had spent decades of her life writing her own life story by hand, on notepads, hotel room memo pads, yellow legal pads, journals, whatever she could find when she had a memory or story she thought important. When she was dying, she asked if I would finish it to take her banner out of the dust. I spent five years transcribing her handwritten notes to form a cohesive story of a journey of a young black girl born in 1928 in Henderson, Texas, born on the cusp of the Depression, one of eight siblings picking cotton, working as a maid, living in utter poverty, raised by a single mother with a father often in jail, moving from house to house, trying to eke out a living in shelters that could barely be called a home, yet holding on to a dream. A dream that was something more, something better, something different. She knew that her life was extraordinary. That black women didn't rise up in the 1930s and 40s and go to college. That dark-skinned black girls who were smart and the class valedictorian but poor didn't get to go to college. That a dark-skinned black girl who was raped by her brother doesn't often survive with her mind intact with enough sanity and perseverance to keep on keeping on that a woman who had to use the outhouse was never supposed to get to the White House to see and meet presidents of the United States, including a black president, and watch her son play classical music recitals for them. She knew that in a world of, se of legalized segregation and discrimination, doors were never supposed to be open for her, that black women didn't get PhDs and become professors in the 1970s. She knew it would be important for her to capture the story of her life. No one was going to do it for her. No famous journalist would seek her out. She knew she had to document her often invisible fight for our place, our right to be, our right to exist, to be valued, and to be heard. She knew she had to represent the invisible Negro mother who, with courage, conviction, and confidence, navigates America with grace and class that never gets acknowledged. How unique was her journey? from picking cotton to being a college professor. 
1940, approximately 90% of African Americans lived in poverty. Only 12% had completed high school and less than 2% had a college degree. When Mildred became a full professor in the academy after getting two master's degrees and a PhD, black women represented less than 1% of all full professors. Most African Americans were like Mildred's mother who only had a sixth grade education. So why did Mildred want to share her journey? In her own words, she says, I was born and grew up in a time in rural Texas when black people were not viewed as human beings, entitled to all the rights and privileges as the white people. My life during that time was characterized by legalized segregation. I have protested the treatment of African Americans and females since I was a child. I could go on and on with my examples of the protest on behalf of African Americans and the shaft that many black women get. Many of us paved the way for so many who now reap the benefits of our protest. Many black females protested to open the doors for the current generation. We must remember that we rode on the backs of those who went before us and we have a responsibility to be the backs for those who come after us. Mildred Pratt has symbolically come back today to be the back for those who come after her, but also to charge each of you to be the back for another. Her life narrative spans almost 100 years from the early 1900s to the early 2000s. Her journey took her through every major city in America, Kansas City, Los Angeles, Detroit, Pittsburgh, from the south of the United States to the west coast to the east coast, moving, trying to make a way out of no way. She felt a responsibility to share how she made it with the hope that it could help others make it. So what do we learn from the journey of this black woman whose grandmother was a slave? There are many lessons to learn from her life, but today I want to share just one key lesson. Her life is an example of challenging and disrupting the status quo. Why is this important? Because she would not have succeeded if she had not challenged the status quo. The question on the table that each of us must answer is, are we willing to disrupt the status quo, or will we continue to be the status quo? This question is particularly important for women because society was structured for us not to be part of the status quo. In writing and co-editing Journeys of Social Justice, Women of Color Presidents in the Academy, we documented the particular challenges that women in particular must fight in higher education to disrupt the status quo in order to justify their existence, their place, and space and right to be leaders, to be at the helm, to take the reins, to hold the steering wheel. Why is the fight so hard? It is because institutions are structured through their systems, structures, policies, procedures, practices, policies, and politics to perpetuate their existence. By definition, this is a status quo. An institution doesn't exist for 150 years without preserving and legitimizing its essential structures. So in American society, America was founded on an explicit commitment to freedom and liberty for some at the expense and on the backs of others. In America, wealth, gender, and skin color have resulted in complex societal relationships that have granted rights and opportunities to some and in the process created barriers and limits for others. What is required to challenge the status quo? How did Mildred do it? With her voice. Her life is an example of the importance of voice, of speaking up, of calling a thing what it is, of denouncing, of pronouncing, of proclaiming, of naming, of challenging. We learn about the power of one voice. A lesson of being courageous in defining moments for all of our lives of have defining moments. Moments when we need to speak up, stand up, and rise up. What were those defining moments for Mildred? As a little girl at the age of eight, she remembers going to the mailbox to get the mail, and the postman said, hey boy. And she said she, he knew she was not a boy. She was a girl in a dress with braids. But in the 1940s, outside of the depression in rural segregated East Texas and across the South, as she said, blacks were not seen as humans and girls were invisible. Yet she found her voice and she proudly proclaimed, I am not a boy, I'm a girl. 
She ran home, told her mother, who told her to never do that again. Not understanding why, that in the 1940s, speaking to a white man like that could mean death. Her life would be spent challenging what we call today misgendering. In any place and space where men and women, restaurants, grocery stores, the malls, would casually address her with the colloquial, how you guys doing today? Her voice would rise up each and every time with an anger that never abated, and she would say, I am not a guy. For she knew she always had to challenge how she was spoken to and to claim, if only for herself, her identity as a black woman. For she was challenging misgendering that so many of our LGBTQ friends experienced before it was even defined. In high school, in her senior year, the senior class sponsor decided that a boy, not a girl, should be the class president, even though the valedictorian, which was Mildred, was always the class president. Mildred chose to question her. Though the outcome didn't change, it was a stance and a statement. We must make stances and statements even when the outcome might not change. As an assistant professor going up for tenure in 1972, almost 50 years ago, Mildred wrote a letter to the president of the university, chastising him and calling out the racism of the institution in her tenure case. And this is what part of the letter said. Dear Mr. President, I have found myself since early April caught up in an entanglement regarding my department's recommendation that I be appointed to the position of associate professor. As I have been struggling through the maze of what you describe as inefficiency, my intellectual struggle to understand led me to conceptualize the situation as institutional racism. Now, Mr. President, I'm not a lawyer. But like most black people in the sea of white, I have had to learn with my fellow brothers and sisters that life in America is a constant diet of struggle for justice. Being competent is not a passport in this white sea, but is a symbol for stand black further, because a competent black threatens the secure feeling of the racist in his myth that all blacks are inferior. I have then decided that this appointment process at this university is filled with deliberately built-in stumbling blocks. Let me provide a brief summary of some of the many inconsistencies which I have encountered. Since you have the final decision-making responsibility here on campus, I am placing the facts on your, in your hands. I refuse to be insulted. Okay, so what happened here? A black woman, 1972, wrote a letter to the president of the university about her tenure case, saying, no, not cool, stop the racism. I refuse to be insulted. There was no movement, no hashtag, no me too. It was just a woman of one. How often as women do we speak up? To our supervisor, to the dean, to the vice president, to our department head, to tenured faculty, to the person who has said a racist or sexist comment in a meeting, when do we speak to those in authority with power over us, with decision-making authority? We don't need permission to do it, for permission will never be given. If we wait, it will never come. Mildred didn't wait. She always spoke on her own behalf, telling her story up until a few weeks before she died. In the hospital dying of cancer at the 80, the age of 83, she turned to me one day and said, Mena, this should be in the book and this should be told. She proceeded to tell me about being raped by her brother at the age of 11. Ironically, her sister, Bernice, after my mother passed, told me that she had seen the rape. She says, I saw him take Mildred under the mound, beat her, and make her submit to him. I bent down and peeked and saw him rape Mildred. She says, I didn't tell Mama because I didn't have the words for it. I would have told about the rape if I had the words. I didn't. I left it alone. I would have told my mom if I had the words. So we have to ask, do we have the words? And if no, how can we get the words? And if yes, what do we do with the words? I believe we must begin to use the words as our power. 
Great leaders like Martin Luther King Jr., Jr., Fannie Lou Hamer used their words to challenge the moral conscience of America and to motivate and move stagnant, scared, terrified black and white Americans to engage in nonviolent protest with words, with one voice. Yet each of us has that voice. The choice is ours, for the voice is ours. We get the choice of when we use it and how we use it. Mildred's life was influenced by teachers who spoke just a word. Mrs. Ira Henry, who told her that she could go to college, even though poor, even though black, and that that was a small school that would allow her to work and go to school. One teacher, one voice. While working at that school, she was a maid. As a maid for the dean of students, she was recommended to be the maid for the new interim president. The interim president asked her what her next step was. Realizing there was no next step for a first generation black girl, he invited her to be the maid for his family in Indianapolis and secured a scholarship for her to go to Butler University. One man, one voice. He used his power and influence to open a door with funding for her. We need more men to do that, to open the doors for women, to be not just mentors, sharing the unspoken rules of the game, but also sponsors, using their own power and social capital to actually open the door. Not in a paternalistic, chivalry-like manner, but in a political way for women to walk through. Challenging the status quo doesn't always require being in a perceived position of power. Even those of us who seemingly, seemingly have no power can impact the status quo. When Mildred was finishing her master's degree in religion and realizing that as a woman she could not have a career in religion, she decided to get a master's degree in social work at Indiana University. Near the end of her program, she ran out of money. Petitioning the dean for a scholarship, she was told that it could not be awarded to a black woman. Sitting outside the office and crying, the secretary asked her what was wrong. Sharing that she did not have any money, the secretary gave her money from her own pocket. One woman, one voice, one question. Are you okay? What do you, what do you need? Notice, the person in power, the dean, said no. The secretary, a woman perceived to have no power, said yes. Decades later, Mildred became that same woman in that voice. She created in her department a small fund to help students in need so that if another Mildred ever came around, there would be help. The question for each of us is, what will we do with our voice, with our power, with our positions of influence, and with our words? Will we use it to disrupt the status quo, to create a more equitable and just society, or will we not? Each of us at some point will have power. How will you use it? When will you use it? And who will you use it to help? What most often empowers us to use our voice and our power is a certain spirit and mindset. For me, it was anger. As a younger college student, I had a wild, undirected passion. An anger, a rage, a deep pain caused by the mere experience of being a black woman in America. It was a righteous indignation at the world, at life, at the unfairness of it all. I often think that if others, and if more, became more angry with a rage, society would change faster. Rage and anger is a powerful energy, an energy that can be channeled for justice. I believe that all great leaders have deep rage, simmered and filtered through different lenses, guides, and boundaries so that it can be effectively channeled for good. So today I ask you, what angers you deeply? What might enrage you? Interrogate yourself. Is it a deep social cause, a cause involving injustice? 
Right now, as a nation, as a world, we need to begin to develop a righteous indignation towards injustice, towards issues of humanity, towards police killing of black Americans, towards differential health care, towards pay and equity for women and minorities, towards a differential treatment of largely white Americans impacted by the opioid crisis and black Americans impacted by crack. All drugs, all addictions. One leads to a war on drugs, the other leads to the opioid crisis. One gets the investment of millions of dollars of grant money to address the crisis compassionately. The other gets the investment of millions of dollars in the criminal justice system to address the crisis criminally. One population gets compassion, another gets incarceration. And so black Americans remain incarcerated at the highest rates in the world. And black women are some of the fastest growing prison population. And at the same time, we legalize marijuana in some states so that some Americans can legally treat their psychic, physical, emotional, spiritual, and psychological pain medically. All drugs, all addictions. Some get compassion, some get incarceration, and some just get to get high. I'm angry about injustice, suffering, and humanity. Mildred was too. She channeled her anger into social work with a focus on empowering others as a social work professor. In one of her signature accomplishments, she founded the Bloomington Normal Black History Project, capturing the life histories of 100 African Americans through an oral history project, sitting down with them as individuals, listening, learning to them share their journey in America about race and their daily fights against injustice. Her goal was to empower them, even as elderly African Americans, and to empower her students to care, to think about social work differently, to understand history, and to use anger for good. She did this by listening compassionately. There's power in listening. We used to listen then, look people in the eye. There was no social media, no cell phones. We paid attention to people. We cannot lead change without listening compassionately for understanding and then most importantly doing. In the doing, you might have to be disruptive. You must realize that you are working within a system not designed to support the vulnerable, the poor, the people of color, the different. The question is, what are you willing to do for them? Are you willing to do something different, something disruptive? Are you going to enforce the status quo? Because that's how it's been done. So if you're willing to disrupt the status quo, how do you do it? Those of us who care must learn the words, the language, and the tools. As Christoph shared, my own journey started at the University of Iowa, a bachelor's degree in literature, a minor in philosophy and African American studies, allowed me to start questioning and interrogating issues of race in America. And then my journey continued at Vanderbilt as a law student, a PhD student in sociology, where I realized it's not just about race for me, but about gender, class, ability, religion, beliefs, values. But most importantly, I learned that it's about power. What I learned in my work is that social change, meaningful and transformational and sustainable social change, can only occur through social movements, which shift the way in which power has operated. Power, ideologies of oppression, structures of oppression, rules of oppression, and relationships of oppression almost operate invisibly, stitched into the fabric of American society, into our minds as culture, the way things are and we are made to believe the way things should be. Changing culture can only happen by shifting power. I think education gives us the words and the tools, and those of us who care as allies, advocates, and activists, sometimes as individuals of one, as one voice, have to commit publicly, privately, courageously, relentlessly, persistently, and unyieldingly to dismantling the system in all its manifestations to create a just and equitable world. This will require an immense level of courage and determination that sometimes I'm not sure we have. It's the same courage and fearlessness that led men, women, and children during the Civil Rights Movement to march without weapons, facing dogs, 
guns, and water hoses to demonstrate their humanity and to demand the rights associated with being Americans. The courage was generated largely by the power of Martin Luther King's words and voice and charismatic leadership. We must not underestimate the power of voice and leadership, especially if we recognize that leadership is the ability to persuade others to actions with words. Leadership can create movements, for movements are like earthquakes shifting tectonic plates, shifts that create change, and successful social movements move people and motivate normally agnostic, ambivalent, apathetic masses to action for a moral cause. The system understands the power of voice for energy, for words have energy and power. The world seeks to silence dissenters and to limit free speech and freedom of the press. The hegemonic world in which we live has socialized silence. I think how often women, people of color, advocates, and allies are silent, unable or unwilling to speak. A black woman law professor once said, there are still some times when I am silent, most often because I am afraid. Sometimes justifiably, sometimes not. Yet usually, I do not achieve anything as a, as a result of my silence. Silence does not cause the fear to disappear. Silence does not make me feel more secure. Silence does not dispel ignorance. I believe that we must refuse to be silent and silenced. Fighting against the silence is a means of survival, but also a radical act of courage because the perilousness of our existence as marginalized people demands that we continue to speak, to voice our concerns, and become more courageous. This is a courage that I encourage others to have even as myself, I myself work on stiffening my own backbone. In the past year, I've been using social media to share my words on Facebook, on my Twitter handle of Mena PC, through a blog on my own website, on a range of topics, on white male privilege, talking about words and whiteness, writing about being black, brilliant, and bruised, and reflecting on connections between issues of race, gender, religion, and the law. I also write about life. At the beginning of the year, I wrote an essay on lessons learned from playing basketball, lessons about life and leadership. I'm gonna briefly share a few of those lessons as I prepare to close. Lesson one, learn a new thing. It's good for us to learn a new thing, to stretch ourselves, to get out of our comfort zone. Lesson two, challenges and obstacles. I'm short, as you can see. Most podiums are not designed for women, but that's a conversation for another day. <laughs> but my height makes it more challenging to play basketball, but there are short ones who are good ones. They have to do more and do it differently. They have to treat the obstacle as a challenge to overcome. The life lesson is to not let a challenge become an obstacle. In America, race and gender and class are realities. As a black woman, my journey is more challenging. It doesn't mean I can succeed. It just means I have to work harder and differently. Lesson number three, rules matter. When I first got on the court, I was a bit overwhelmed by all the lines. Obviously, basketball courts and gyms are multi-purpose places, and other games can be played on them. I had to learn which lines matter. The three-point line, the three-throw line, the out-of-bounds line. I had to learn about traveling and double dribbling. Lines, boundaries, and rules matter. You have to know about them to play within them or around them. Lesson four, technique matters. There are skills to be learned in any new adventure. The right technique makes a difference. It doesn't mean that bad technique can't result in good outcomes, but form matters. Look good at what you're doing. In life, it's important to master the technique of your profession. There are techniques in life, ways of doing a thing that can make a difference. Lesson five, practice matters. I've been practicing a few mornings a week, often alone. I think I'm getting better slowly. In life, doing a thing with an intentionality to learn a passion and a desire for excellence makes a difference. Lesson six, having a coach. Coaches make a difference. <coughs> My daughter came to visit me and said, what are you doing? She showed me a few quick skills. Coaches and life matter. They can show us the way, provide direction, guidance, and encouragement. Lesson seven, concentration. 
Basketball, like a lot of life, requires concentration. You just can't hurl the ball up there. You have to focus on dribbling, on shooting, on aiming. You have to focus. In life, you have to focus. Lesson eight, coordination. Basketball is a game of coordination. You have to be able to run, dribble, and shoot. The life lesson is that we have to coordinate many things. We live in a world that rarely affords us the luxury of a singular focus, and we have to multitask. Lesson nine, individuals and teams. I've been a team of one, practicing on my own. But I can see, though, the fun and value of a team. Get someone else to pass the ball to, to talk to, to cheer. I like teams. There's value in being part of a team. Lesson 10, being guarded. Sometimes in life we are guarded. Guarded by opposition, arms up a barrier. We have to find a way around. The last lesson, having fun. As always, I think life should be about having as much fun as possible. Laughing with another, laughing at yourself. I created an alter ego, Queen of Shebad. <laughs> <laughs> and my daughter filmed me in a short video on my website. It's called When a Black Woman Plays Basketball. It was fun and funny. So as I close, I do want to remind us about the importance of having fun, but also understanding that there's a cost to this social justice work, a cost of hard work, perseverance, courage, and endurance. You may be ostracized, isolated, and there will be tears and loneliness, for there is a cost. But we must show others the way and be willing to bear the cost on our backs as she encouraged us to do. So when those of us who are traditionally powerless and we have access to power and to spaces where there is power, we have to assume the power we don't believe we have even in those spaces, even if we are outsiders. Muffet McGraw, the women's basketball coach for Notre Dame, recently spoke up when she was interviewed as part of the NCAA finals game and talking about the presence of women in leadership. She said that girls are socialized to think that, quote, men run the world, and that sports should be a place to counter that narrative. She said, when you look at men's basketball, 90%, 99% of the jobs go to men. Why shouldn't 100% or 99% of the jobs in women's basketball go to women? Maybe it's because we only have 10% of women who are athletic directors. People hire people who look like them. And that's the problem. The data bears that out. In 1972, Title IX enacted gender equity policies in student athletes. Two years later, more than 90% of women's teams in college sports had female coaches. Today, it's only 41%. So Muffet rightly asked, how are young women looking up and seeing someone that looks like them preparing them for the future? We don't have enough female role models. We don't have enough visible women leaders. We don't have enough women in power. And so I'm going to end with a final word of advice from a quote in Women Who Run With Wolves. Do not cringe or feel small if you are called the black sheep, a maverick, the lone wolf. Those with slow seeing say that a non-conformist is a blight on society. But it has been proven over centuries that being different means standing at the edge, means that one is practically guaranteed to make an original contribution, a useful and stunning contribution to her culture. If you have ever been called defiant, incorrigible, forward, cunning, insurgent, unruly, rebellious, you're on the right track. <laughs> Thank you very much.